Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for attending. I am very excited to host the UPT Sigma Vector Tandem Instructor Emergency Procedures for 2023. My name is Allison Cooney, and I'm the owner of Skydive Vancouver Island, and it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Erica Dufour and John Kieran as our guest speakers. Erica started skydiving in 2006. She's had her tandem rating since 2008, and she became a tandem examiner in 2010. It's one of the things that I think she has loved the most about her whole entire skydiving career. John Kieran joins us from Skydive the Ranch. He got into skydiving in 2000. He got his tandem rating in 2005 and quickly realized how much he loved to coach and mentor other tandem instructors. So he got his examiner rating in 2021. I'm not going to delay this any further. Erica, John, welcome to the panel. And I'm going to let you guys take it off from there. Thank you, Allison. Thank you Thank very you. much. So everybody, thank you for being here today. So today is going to be a very concise, um, guided review. Uh, our goal, John and I, is to uh, encourage conversation. So this is not intended in any way to be a replacement for a proper review. Uh, what we want is to show you some broad strokes and generate some discussion. So you should feel like you're able to take this video, watch it as a group, pause it, and have discussion. John, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, I always tell people to look at it throughout the year. Um, the beginning of the season, safety day, that time, everybody's real up on getting current. But I feel like when you get into the meat of the season, people kind of forget that they need to continually think about these situations. The more current you get, the, probably the further you are since you've had a problem. So you could use this as a guide, look back on it, not just at the beginning of the year. Great. Uh, so reminder from both of us that this is not meant to replace a proper emergency procedures review or a reading of the UPT manual. Um, and then here are just a couple of resources that we recommend that you view regularly. So the UPT vector manual should be a given. And then additionally, uh, the APF does offer some excellent videos on their website. They are geared more towards sport emergency procedures, uh, but definitely have some value for discussion purposes. Uh, so moving in, John. Uh, so it's important to remember in the beginning of the season, you want to get current. If it's been more than 90 days, um, UPT says you need to do a jump with an experienced jumper. They should be B licensed and have at least 100 uh, jumps. Over 180 days is what they consider to be uncurrent. So you need to do recurrency training, which means sitting down with an examiner, pulling handles, uh, going through the manual, doing a solo and a jump with an experienced jumper. Uh, and also thinking towards hand cam, the beginning of the season, a lot of times managers, DZOs aren't sure who's where you really need to make sure that you have at least 200 tandems post uh, getting your rating before you can think about putting a hand cam on. Great. And then some important altitudes to review. Uh, minimum exit altitude, again, this is outlined by UPT, is 7,500 feet AGL. Open by altitude being 4,000 feet. So this was published a number of years ago and will, of course, vary based on the opening characteristics of your equipment. Uh, so you should have a fully inflated parachute by 4,000 feet AGL and your decision altitude of 3,000 feet. That sometimes also you might hear, hear referred to as your hard deck. Basically, that's the final cutoff for when you are going to decide whether you're keeping a parachute or not. Okay, and the purpose of that number is so that we don't have to continue wondering whether we should kick a little bit harder out of these line twists. Uh, 3,000 feet, if you can't land the parachute as it is, 3,000 feet is when UPT says you don't have to make that decision anymore. They've made it for you. All right, sound good, John? Yep. All right, reminders, um, you don't want to just jump right into tandems. You should get current on your own before you then get back into tandems. Uh, assess your physical state early in the season. Winter time is when I have problems with food. So, you know, wing loading goes up. Uh, your 
stretching, things like that might have suffered. So you just want to make sure you're paying attention to how you feel. Really focus on gear checks. It's easy to just kind of like, oh, this is the rig I remember. And you really need to take your time. Uh, nothing wrong with adding drag, if it's especially if it's colder in the beginning of the season. It just gives you a leg up on flying. Uh, really focus on hookups and gear checks. It's easy to feel current, but also you're not as current as you think you are. So just leave yourself a little extra time, maybe get hooked up a little early and just, you know, don't jump back into where you left off. Really just leave yourself a little bit of leeway so that you can deal with any funny things that come up. And I think just stick with solid exits. Keep it simple in the beginning of the year. That dude who wants to do flips, he came out in March or April. Who cares? Just keep it simple and just like have a good start to the season because it's when a lot of problems happen. Great. All right, so now we're going to move into just a couple of videos that will uh, allow us to guide a little bit more discussion. Uh, these will be kind of chronological order a little bit in the way that we approach our, our jumps. Uh, John and I would remind you again that this isn't a replacement for a course. This isn't recurrency training, and this isn't your full emergency procedures review. Uh, John and I are going to make a very concerted effort not to add a lot of anecdotes to our discussion here today so that you can do that as a group. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and play this video. This one's regarding boarding and aircraft emergencies. When we sit down in the plane, uh, I usually tell people first thing they should do is get their seatbelt ready, get their student seatbelt ready. Just a reminder, students need to have their own seatbelt and know how to use them in case of an emergency that, that they can let themselves out. Uh, 1,000 feet, 1,500 feet, whatever your DZ is, have them take the seatbelt off. You take your seatbelt off. Our custom is to hook up the lowers. So I usually tell my student, oh, they're going to open up the door for some fresh air. I let this out, slide behind, hook up one and two. In case of an emergency, remember if you are below 1500 feet, you're staying with the plane uh, from above 1500 to 3000. Procedure is to hook up just the left. If that's the only one you can get because you can Nelson on the right and grab your reserve here. The book actually says if you have an emergency exit, above 4,500 feet and you can only hook up one, you hook up the right because then you can do the drogue. I really feel like you can get both hooked up in that time, but a book says to just do the one, it's the right above 4,500 feet. All right, so again, concise, a uh, great outline of how exactly you should start being seated in the airplane, but also a great point for you guys to discuss at your own drop zones with your own seating configuration in your own aircraft. What this looks like in a Cessna 182 or a 206 is going to look different than it does in a Porter, a Caravan, or an Otter. John? Yeah. Um, just, you know, make sure that there's a lot of distractions going on on the plane, focus on you, focus on your students, and just uh, use those checkpoints as you get to certain altitudes, you know that, okay, I, we have a problem, I'll be getting out instead of staying in, and just, you know, keep an eye on the way up and get a flow that you can stick with throughout all your jumps. Great. When we sit down in the plane, uh... So moving on to our uh, next video, we're gonna just look at uh, hookup and systems check. When it comes time to get hooked up, you wanna make sure that you are ready to get hooked up before you start dealing with the student. So I use the, the reminders of I'm okay, you're okay, and then we're okay. I'm okay is making sure that all my gear is ready before I start dealing with the student. So I'll get my helmet on, get my goggles sorted, and then I'll reach back, check my drogue, primary, secondary, cutaway, reserve, RSL, chest strap, leg straps especially, because you can't really get to them once you're hooked up. Once you're all sorted, I'm okay. Then you wanna check with your student, you're okay. And what I like to do is just go over the harness and make sure they are ready to be hooked up. So, hey Aaron, I'm just gonna take a look at your harness before we go nicely as I can. Leg straps are stowed tight, belly band is stowed, chest strap is stowed. I'm not too concerned with the tightness there because that's going to change once we get hooked up. Make sure they have their goggles, make sure they know when they're going to put them on. Super easy to get distracted with that kind of stuff. But you're okay 
and then we're gonna go through the hookup procedure and then uh, we're okay is the final check once we're all done. Once you're done with probation, it's free to leave these hooked and then just check them when you get hooked up. So I'm just gonna go through my hookup procedure. Hey Aaron, I'm gonna get us all hooked up for the jump. I want you to sit up nice and tall. And so we have four hooks that hold us together. One, two on the bottom. I'm gonna tighten them up in a minute. Up top, got number three. And over here is number four. Now I'm gonna tighten up the bottom two. Quick look at the belly band. Stow those out of the way. All right. One, two, three, four. We are completely hooked. Now I'm gonna go through our full check of we're okay. I like to kind of do this from the back of my rig up, down the connections, and then up the student's harness. So we have drove, primary, secondary, Cutaway, Reserve, RSL, one, two, three, four. Nicely as I can. Leg straps are secured and tight. Belly band is secured. Chest strap is locked. We are ready to go. How do you feel, Aaron? I'm ready to go. Excellent. When the door opens up, I'm gonna have you put your goggles on. We'll slide down the uh, bench and then you can go over everything you're doing on your skydive. All right, it's a great video. Uh, again, I think this shows just about everything that you need to be able to discuss, making sure that you're following a good hookup procedure and a systems check in the aircraft. This is again gonna vary based on how full your aircraft is, whether you have fun jumpers with you or if you're in a 182. Uh, so take this time, pause the video if you need to, talk about how this is different uh, for you in your operation um, and if it might differ with altitudes as you start in on your season versus where you ended off with a current end to your last season. Any last notes on that, John? Uh, the one thing I want to say is obviously uh, I jump out of an otter. So this is how that hookup looks there. Like you said, you're going to discuss it based on your plane. The one thing I want to remind everybody, um, I think UBT wants to have a goal of minimal adjustment in the plane, they want people getting in ready to jump. Now there's always some room for adjustment. People are different sizes and getting hooked up in different planes poses different challenges, but you should be getting on a plane in a configuration that you would feel okay getting out. Doesn't mean you can't adjust, but you shouldn't be getting in with the harness loose. You need to be able to ready to skydive getting onto the plane. Yeah, that's great, John. Thank you for that reminder. When so moving into drogue and handles check. So cue Aaron and John again here. Starting with standard, you have your hands on your harness. We'll talk about exits and planning exits and having solid exits, but we want to launch into the wind. Ready, set, arch, leave into the wind. And we set the drogue, check the drogue, go through our handle checks. Primary, Secondary, cutaway, reserve, RSL. One more time. Primary, secondary, cutaway, reserve, RSL, cap student. Hands come out, we're skydiving. Awesome. Great, again, I cannot emphasize how important it is to go over this a number of times, especially with the newer tandem instructors, but also newer in the season. I always like to emphasize that really strong drogue throw. That strong drogue throw eliminates a lot of opportunities for emergency procedures for us to be able to avoid. So uh, great demonstration, John, anything to add? Uh, just to make sure your handle checks are actually checks and not slaps. Um, everybody focuses a lot of time on just getting through them to move on with the jump, but you know, especially with hand cam, uh, one of the adages I always loved was, Bad video of a good jump is way better than good video of a bad jump. So just get the handle checks out of the way. When the student's looking at their video five, 10 years from now, they're never going to know that, oh, I wish you didn't move around or whatever. Handle checks are important. Just make them part of your jump. Agreed. Thanks, John. And really, if that extra two to three seconds is making a difference, then uh, 
you maybe need to discuss uh, the altitude that your drop zone is jumping at to allow for the extra two or three seconds for that, that to happen. All right, so post opening procedures. Action. <laughs> Once we open, first thing you wanna do, go through your canopy checks. Canopy, lines, links, cables, cutaway, reserve, RSL, connections. Then we want to do our controllability, grab all four toggles, pop them, right turn, left turn, flare. Once we know we have a landable canopy, then we can deal with our passenger. You want to undo the bottoms, loosen them up, rehook, and then go through the goggles, chest strap, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to get us a little more comfortable in our harness. So we undo the bottoms. Loosen, reattach. Why don't you bring your knees up for me? There we go, nicely as I can, and get a little bit of breathing room. Open up the chest strap. Awesome, relax, perfect. Then you're ready to give the toggles to the students and fly. All right. Great. Um, so another excellent reminder, uh, one of the things I like to note is the difference in where those handles are now versus where they were when John was just wearing the rig. So now that everything's kind of shifted a little bit, it's a really good idea. We don't usually practice handles checks under canopy, but it's a great idea every so often uh, to make sure that you are looking at those. So if you end up with an emergency procedure, you know, after a canopy check, you know where those handles are for you. Uh, just want to add, uh, especially with hand cam, but also on regular jumps, it's very easy to get distracted. Students are overwhelmed. Just make sure you are getting your controllability check done, full controllability, brake toggles and everything, because if you go to pick up your brake toggles way down low and there's some sort of issue, you've now passed the, the point of decision altitude. So make sure you have a landable canopy before you move on with everything else on the jump. Great. Uh, the other piece that I often like to, to add in is as you get comfortable making sure that you're doing that controllability check, um, I think it's important to add in directioning, like to directing yourself to the right area as you're going to move on. You know, usually even when we're really seasoned, it's still going to take us 30 seconds or so to get the student configured. And during that time, ideally, we're flying in the direction we want to be flying. So um, usually for me, that that looks like a bigger left turn than right turn to put me where I need to go um, once I've done my canopy check. Does that sound, uh, does that resonate with no, you, John? I was going to say, absolutely. My left check of controllability might be 270 and then my right's like a 30, like you said, to just get pointed into the wind or start heading back from a spot. So you can do both controllability and making sure you're where you need to be. Exactly. And again, these are all things that's kind of that experience bucket needs to get filled before um, we can start adding these other things in. Uh, but they will really help if you can if you can start putting that into your procedure uh, once you have you know a solid handle on it. Uh, which I think trans which I think translates to have a good opening altitude. You don't have to be getting down stupid low. Um, just give yourself time. And then as you feel more comfortable and fill that experience bucket, if it comes down a little bit, fine, but you can give yourself enough time to feel comfortable with this. And then a couple of uh, anecdotes, which I assure you, I, and I will avoid most of them. Um, if for uh, the passenger, if your chest strap is really, really loose, that can tend to put their uh, harness out quite far. So just keeping in mind that that can be a source of discomfort uh, for passengers. And then as John had mentioned in the wintertime, sometimes that's when we uh, tend to eat a little bit more, um, you know, cookies and cake at Christmas. And otherwise um, having a, a larger, like a, people might refer to it as a beer belly, but having a, a larger midsection uh, can actually be very uncomfortable for a student as well. So just keeping in mind that um, that will actually put them in a different position and add extra pressure to their shoulders as well. Uh, so it's just something to be mindful of if they're not responding at all times to your requests. Sometimes that can be part of the equation. All right. Uh, so we'll move along to uh, another way of looking at emergency procedures. So John, if you want to just uh, give a little bit of a preamble on this one. Um, so the tandem malfunction tree can be super intimidating to look at. And how I was trained as an examiner and how I trained my candidates is there are really only 
for emergency procedures, uh, the way they end. There's all sorts of different emergencies that can happen and they start in many different ways. Uh, I like to call them three buckets and then one oddball, um, but there's really only three procedures that they can fit into. So that when I talk to my candidates about how to deal with malfunctions, it's to observe what's going on. And the first thing I tell them is stop and breathe not rushing, not trying to get through it. This is why we have good uh, opening altitudes and give ourselves time. Figure out which of these buckets this uh, problem that you're dealing with is going to fit into and then deal with that problem. So I kind of think of, is this an open or a closed or an open canopy? So they all end the same way. If it fits into that bucket, it's going to have the same ending of the emergency procedure, which is kind of how we presented it here. All right. So we'll move into a closed container emergency procedure. So this also sometimes you might hear referred to as a total malfunction. So the, the pin is still in. Um, we'll go ahead and play that video. Container closed, no drogue, or the drogue is trapped around you or the bridle is trapped around you. Anything where either you can't get the drogue out or the drogue is out but not free and clear from you closed container procedure is to go directly to the reserve. So let's just say I couldn't get my drogue out. One try, two tries, stop, see what's going on, and then hand here, feel reserve, pull reserve. All right, so as John and I've said more than one time, we're not gonna elaborate on this. There are a lot of procedures that would potentially use this, um, discuss those. So talk about them right now. You can pull out the, that, the tree that's in the UPT manual. There's also some lists generated of all the different emergency procedures that you can possibly have. Uh, look at those and then associate which one of those emergency procedures would use uh, this procedure. And uh, yeah, I just want to add, like uh, you had said, this is the end point. There are ways to fix problems. There are ways to not fix problems. So are there are a lot of things that can lead to this, but this is just the procedure for uh, the container being closed and you don't have a drogue free and clear behind you. Great. All right. So then our canopy EP or just, I mean, what I guess what we would refer to in the skydiving world is just a standard emergency procedure, a standard cutaway. Emergency procedure with an open canopy. So anything from a bag lock on, you're going to be cutting away, ensuring release of the risers, and then pulling the reserve. RSL is great, we don't count on it. Uh, if you can, and you have the ability with the low speed malfunction, I would have their, your student put your hands on your harness, arch, so bring your legs back, you can control the student's legs, both hands on the handles, feel the Velcro, cut away, Ensure release of the canopy, feel the Velcro, pull the reserve. Check your reserve. I feel like that speaks for itself. Anything to add, John? Um, just, I think it's important that when you're coming from the sports side, there are the two-handed uh, type of emergency procedures and the one hand or the two hands on one handle, two hands on the other. This is a you know one hand on each handle scenario, which is why they're very clear that they wanna make sure you ensure the release of the risers. Uh, malfunctions, it's a high stress scenario and you don't wanna just start pulling your reserve as you're cutting away or before you're completely cut away. And that's why they add in the cutaway, ensure the release of the risers and then pull your reserve. Uh, I think maybe the only other piece to that is that we've gotten pretty used to the sky hook in recent years. So it's a pretty quick canopy transfer. Uh, they do fail uh, on occasion. So that being the only other reason to make sure that you're following through on uh, the deployment of the reserve. All right, open container emergency procedure. So this uh, sometimes would also be referred to as a partial malfunction. Uh, so I'll go ahead and play this video. Reserve. So I release the drogue, feel a trap door, nothing happens after that. I know my container is open. I find the RSL, pull the tab, release the RSL, cut away, clear the risers, pull the reserve.
Uh, so I think this one's a really good one for discussion. Uh, so John, if you want to just, uh, I mean, realistically, I'd love for people to talk about them among themselves, but specifically, when would you see yourself using this emergency procedure? Uh, so this is kind of the in-between um, having the container closed where you've never opened the main or, you know, released the drogue um, and having a canopy over your head. The container is open, but for some reason it's not off your back. You could have broken a closing loop on the way out of the plane and not been able to get the drogue out um, to then, you know, open your canopy or you, the one of the ones that would fall into this is what they call a collapsed drogan toe. So you pull the drogue release, feel the trap door happening, which means the container is open, but nothing comes off your back. It's really hard to pinpoint how this one would happen, but it is the in-between. Um, it's kind of like a horseshoe malfunction. There is something happening over your back. And instead of just pulling your reserve into a possible mess, they want you to get what you can control, get the risers off and get some clear space so that you have as much room as you can to uh, deploy the reserve. So just tell me a little bit more about why we add that extra step. Why is it important to clear our risers rather than um, just... Because with the container open, that D-bag could be sitting on your back or the risers could start coming off. There could be lines. You're going to see what looks like a, like a horseshoe you know, could be behind you. And if, especially if you can't see it, if you know the container has been open because maybe you felt that trap door, um, they say like, if you can get the drogue out, if the drogue is still with you or the drogue is trapped on you, try to clear it. But if you can't clear that side of the equation, the only other thing you can clear is those risers. So they want you to disconnect the RSL so that when you get those risers off you, you're not pulling the reserve right away. So they want you to disconnect the RSL, get those risers off and maybe take something that looks like a horseshoe and then have it just connected to you on one side of the container instead of two to try and free up that space to get the reserve out. Great, thanks for that clarification, John. And I do know for, from some colleagues in the sort of test jumping realm of things that when they have tried this, you know, not just a couple of times anecdotally, but when they've tried it time and time again in a wind tunnel, that they do see a much greater amount of success using this procedure than just using a standard cutaway deploy reserve procedure. And I just want to reiterate this along with the, you know, maybe entangled drogue. These type of malfunctions tend to be avoidable. So you want to open up the discussion uh, when you're watching this about how this type of scenario can happen, because even though this is the scenario for that situation, it's not foolproof. It's your best option, but the best option is to avoid this type of scenario altogether. And that's where the discussion comes in with your aircraft, your operation and, and all that. Great. Reserve. All right, so then uh, drogue entanglement with a relative worker or otherwise, let's look at that one. All right. The somewhat oddball that doesn't fall into those two uh, is a drogue entanglement with a video flyer, RW, possibly even a plane. Uh, this one I like to kind of use the shortcut of stripping the right side. You throw the drogue. It is not free and clear when you check. It's entangled with somebody. Give them a little bit to maybe try and get out, but then you are going to release the RSL, cut away, release the drogue on the right side, track to get away to get clear, and then open the reserve. So we are out of the plane, throw the drogue into your video guy, give him a little bit, it's not happening. We disconnect the RSL, cut away, release the drogue, track to get away, get some free space, and then deploy the reserve. That was a really beautiful demonstration of, of that emergency procedure. Thanks, John. Uh, so the one thing, the reason I call this the oddball is one thing I find when I'm training candidates is that they get sometimes confused between the previous one of physically getting the risers off because it's a horseshoe. And then this one, because it start, both of them start with disconnecting the RSL. This one is really only employed in a very specific scenario where you have another person or thing um, entangled with your drogue. So that's why I call it the oddball. And that's why I refer to it as stripping the right side. 
Um, it's not really important that it is the right side, the left side drug release would work also, but I want people to separate this from that other procedure um, because it is a very specific scenario. So if you think of this one as only that, it almost makes the other one, like everything else with the open container then would fall into that other one. So um, it's not as important that it is the right side drug release as it is just, this is that specific scenario where you're entangled with someone and then you just strip the right side. Excellent. And I would invite everyone to discuss at this point um, what sort of the currency requirements are for having somebody jump with you on a tandem. So go ahead and have that discussion on your own time because uh, that can be a great way to avoid ever needing to use this procedure. All right. Um, so I think this is a really great point to just, uh, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and play it. Once your canopy is open, you want to check canopy, lines, links, cables. Then you want to go through your handles, cutaway, reserve, RSL. Fuck, did I just fuck that up? <laughs> canopy, lines, links, cables. Can cutaway, reserve, RSL, connections then controllability. Okay. So. <laughs> so I think the great takeaway here is that whether John did make an error there or not, he didn't know whether he made an error or not because he just wasn't really current in it yet. Right. He's, and it's great. He's, he's going through these motions and he's having these questions about, Oh no, did I do it right? While he's on the ground in a safe space, able to laugh about it rather than while he's, you know, possibly at 4,500 feet, um, trying to remember his procedures. So preparing for this presentation was actually me getting current. And that was me going through the first time thinking that, oh, I got a lot of tandems. I'm an examiner. This will be easy. And it's super easy to get hung up on stuff, especially after a long layoff. So I'll put all my mistakes out there. I make mistakes like everybody else. Um, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes, but uh, like Erica said, make them on the ground. It's a lot better to just get yourself feeling comfortable and current on the ground before the rubber hits the road. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm sure many of us can remember Tom Union. Tom Noonan used to say, "Are you sure?" And he didn't mean that as a question of whether you know that no, no, you're wrong. Can you find the right answer? He meant. Do you have the conviction that when I ask you, are you sure that you know that you are sure? Because that means that you are current. Excellent. Once your canopy's open. All right. So some uh, some concluding thoughts, John. You want to start us off here? Uh, there's no replacement for currency. Um, it's amazing how different I felt after preparing for this video and going through because it helps me realize how other people feel, how my instructors feel, where you could feel confident, but are you? That one question of, are you sure? There's nothing wrong with taking time on the ground, no matter how many jumps you have, no one's looking at you sideways. If they are, then maybe that's another discussion you can have with management or owners or whatever. Like this time that you take on the ground will pay a hundredfold with not having problems uh, moving forward. Yeah. Uh, so probably one of my favorite uh, takeaways to try to leave people with is to rely on outline procedures rather than anecdotal evidence. So what this means in just day to day terms is if uh, somebody, for instance, happens to know someone that was in a car accident and was unable to get out of that vehicle accident because they were wearing their seatbelt, they then decide that it's safer to just not wear a seatbelt. So for that one person, it feels true. It feels like it, there's a very big risk to wearing a seatbelt. But we know from the statistics that seatbelts save lives. What I like to try to remind people is that we each have our own anecdotal experiences, those that we view from our colleagues around us and our own personal jumps. But what is outlined in the UPT procedures is a procedure that is looked at through the lens of statistics, through a lot, a lot of experience, reviewing incidents and being able to actually come up with a set of protocols that works statistically. That means that it works 
more often when done this way and is ultimately the safer way to do things. So I like to remind people of that because it is really easy to internalize these things that we have happened once or twice and trying to put them in perspective that the way that things are outlined in the UPT manual isn't just somebody that's never had this experience. It's actually somebody that's viewed it through the lens of a lot of people's experience. Um, yeah, just to reiterate that, just because somebody did it wrong and survived doesn't mean it was the right answer. So like you said, the, the anecdote of, of not being able to get out of seatbelt, it doesn't mean it was the right choice to then go ahead and not wear a seatbelt. So just refer back to these things. Um, one of the terms that kind of sucks, but is true is that these, all these rules and all these procedures are written in blood. It's because people have made these mistakes. This is what we learned. Don't continue and go back to making mistakes that we've already learned from just follow these procedures and it's, it just keeps it straight in your head. You should be making decisions on the fly. You should just be referring back to what you already know. And when you do have a question about something, a change in procedure that you don't like, because let's be realistic, when we get used to these, this muscle memory, it's a really good thing to have this muscle memory and be used to doing things a certain way. And when all of a sudden we're told that we need to change the way we do those things, it's uncomfortable. It's not pleasant. We don't like it. It's a disruption. And what we were doing worked for us. So when you don't like it, talk about it. Don't just like hole up and keep doing things the way that you were doing. Reach out to somebody you feel comfortable talking about it with and have the discussion. Try to see where this is coming from. Probably myself and John will have uh, felt the same way that you did about having to change the way we did something at some particular time. And we'll have still tried the new way and most likely we'll have gotten adjusted to it and be able to understand the benefits of it, how we've now made our passengers and ourselves safer by doing it. Uh, and I think that kind of leads us into our last point there that um, tandem jumping isn't about you, the instructor, it's about the student. So sometimes it's, we really need to check our ego and just remember that we are here taking somebody else on their first and maybe their only skydive. And that is a huge responsibility. It's not us. It's not for us to just go, you know, have fun and woohoo and whatever. Like I have a lot of fun with tandems, but I have fun with tandems with the eye towards it's not my jump. My responsibility, my only responsibility is to bring that person back down and give them a good first experience with skydiving. So think about if you are concerned with a procedure or how things are done or whatever, why? Is it because you feel like you know more or because you actually think there could be a better way? And if you think there's a better way, then have the discussion with an eye towards that, not because I think it's this way and that's how it should be done or that's how I was taught. If, you know, if you've been doing things the same way forever, there's possible that it could be a better way of doing it. So just remember that it's not about you. It's about the student. All right. So uh, just to, to in conclusion, so if you do want to have some discussions, uh, John and I are both available. Uh, Allison, who's hosting this for us at Skydive Vancouver Island, is also a wealth of resources. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us. You can find us on Facebook. You can send us an email um, and we'd be happy to continue this discussion. So please use this as a resource uh, now and in perpetuity. Things might change change. This was recorded in 2023 and hopefully maybe in 2025, the gear will have changed and the way that we do one of these emergency procedures will have changed. This video can still be used as a discussion of how that has come to be. Excellent. You guys, thank you so much. Uh, Erica, John, your time and dedication to this sport um, and educating others is like none I've ever seen. I appreciate that time and appreciate you guys sharing that uh, with so many people out there. Um, that's about it from me. I hope you guys all have a great day. Be safe, have fun and be safe. That's number one. Thank you all guys. Right. Thank that's you everybody. Thank and you. thank you to Aaron, John's passenger for those yes. videos and whoever did the recordings. Yes. Uh, if <laughs> Yes. Love it. Have a great day.